Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Quinn. Um, I'm a bookseller here at Women and Children First Bookstore. Thanks so much for joining us tonight to celebrate the release of Bodies on the Line. Um, we begin our virtual events as we begin our events in store with the land acknowledgement. Please join me in acknowledging that the land on which the bookstore stands is the unceded and occupied territory of the Potawatomi, Peoria, and Miami people. Um, there are over 75,000 indigenous people living in Illinois, and we strive to recognize native literature and communities. Um, we encourage you to learn more about land acknowledgements and about the rightful owners of the land in which you are viewing tonight's event. Um, please stay tuned for even more events. Um, I'm very excited for a virtual event we'll be hosting on May 5th. Uh, we'll be celebrating the release of Jessica Campbell's graphic novel called Rave, so look out for that. Um, if you're in Chicago, our bookstore is now reopened. We're open Tuesday through Sunday, and anyone anywhere in the U.S. can order from us at womenandchildrenfirst.com. Um, before I introduce these incredible authors, I'd like you to know that you can ask panelists questions anytime by um, using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And if you haven't purchased a book from Women and Children, or if you haven't purchased a book, you can purchase from Women and Children first by clicking the link that I will place in the chat, um, which is also located at the bottom. Um, and you should really purchase this book because Bodies on the Line is an incredible, um, engaging, insightful, and moving book. Um, it was really inspiring reading about the experiences of um, abortion escorts and their dedication, their bravery. Um, this was just so powerful and um, I just admire <laughs> these people immensely um, and I really appreciate this book for centering them. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Lauren Rankin, who is a writer, speaker, and expert in abortion rights in the U.S. She spent six years as an abortion clinic escort in Northern New Jersey. Um, and is a board member for A is For, a reproductive rights advocacy organization. Her work has been featured in the, the Washington Post, The Cut, Fast Company, Team Vogue, Refinery29, NBC News, and many more. Uh, Mickey Kendall is a writer, diversity consultant, and occasional feminist. Um, she is the author of the New York Times bestselling Hood Feminism, as well as a graphic novel titled Amazon's Abolitionists and Activists. Her essays can be found at Time, The New York Times, The Guardian, The Washington Post, Essence, Vogue, and a host of other publications. Uh, thank you both for being here tonight. Um, let you take it away. Thank you. Oh, wow. Sorry. I, I Wrong know. order. <laughs> Erased. Um, let's see if I could bring her back. Technology is on our side. Listen, I told you I had to fight with Crowdcast to get it to ex acknowledge I exist today. It kept telling me I didn't exist as a user. So <laughs> I'm so sorry, Lauren. I'm so sorry. Um, let's do me. <laughs> Wait, Lauren, are you muted? No, I cannot hear you. Um, can people hear me? Okay, they can hear me. They cannot hear you, Lauren. That won't work. That won't work. This is a. This is not the way the event has to go. Listen, y'all. I'm not gonna sing to you. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna sit here while Lauren figures out her tech. I'm gonna tell you that uh, I have a really cool cup today. I'm gonna be super entertaining. Are you muted, Lauren? Did you mute yourself? Oh, your mute icon is on. You are muted. Uh, hold on, do we have, I have no power over you. Uh, they have dropped for a second and I would guess that that, that is, is where this is on. on. We're gonna get it. I promise, promise we're gonna, gonna do this out. Yeah, we know. Um, so I'm trying to see if I can um, do it on my end, but okay, I don't okay. think I can.
So I'm so dropping, I'm dropping a link in, the in the chat for, chat for uh, uh, World, of World of Rosa. Rosa. Julia Rosa, Julia is, Rosa the artist, is the artist made this. Made this <laughs> for people who ask. Like, we're, we're just we're just a lot. Do I have an Do echo, I have an echo now? Um, no. Okay. Okay. For me, for a second, for a I second, did. I did. I don't know. Um, oh, I do, I do have, have an echo. Have an echo. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm going to come, come out. out, come out right back in. Back in. Oh, or, oh, or not. not. I don't want to leave you all with nobody. nobody. Chromecast, Chromecast is turning, is turning on, us. on us. Turning. Turning. Let me see if Let I can see fix my mic. Did that fix that the echo? <laughs> no, no. All right. All right. Can you hear me, you now? Hear me now? We can, we can hear you. You, you, are, you are Echo Vicky, Vicky, but, Vicky but, but you sound amazing. You sound amazing. So I'm here okay, okay, I'm going to come, come out, out and come <laughs> right back in. Right we are journey we are tonight, y'all. I also want to I also want uh, to note that uh, Tamar, note that Tamar said, said the echo is very ominous. Much like the state of abortion access. I mean, oh wait, Ooh. I think I fixed it. Yes. Bye, guys. Hi. <laughs> All right, cool. cool. Everyone, I want to thank you. Now, this is the spirit of Bodies on the Line. Things don't always go the way you plan, but you have to figure it out anyway. Listen. Nikki, is- I'm so glad to be here with you finally. <laughs> We made it. I'm so glad. Um, I'm so glad you wrote this book. So thank you. Here's the thing. Uh, and Lauren and I were talking about this a little bit earlier. I kind of nagged Lauren in my warm, affectionate, aggressive way um, to get it done. Uh, she so did. I'm so unfair. However, no, I'm, I'm so glad you did. <laughs> I, I was like, now I'm, I'm going to just sit here smugly and be like, yes, the book. The book exists. Thank you. You have to do more panels with me, though, so I don't know if you really wanted to sign up for your future. Oh, well. You got it. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I wanted to talk about is that abortion is healthcare. That we are locked in a fight um, about healthcare, effectively, and women's right. And not that I'm saying just women, but women and non-binary and trans right. people's rights, people who can get pregnant right to choose what happens to their body. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about what it means both to be a clinic escort mm. and to see this happening again. Yes. To see this like bad, I remember the eighties and the early nineties and the bombings and all of that, I'm old. We're right back there. Um, you are not old, you are vintage, like a fine wine. I think vintage. I like that. I like but you, I mean, in Chicago, that's such a great point. I, you know, Chicago was really kind of the epicenter for a lot of Operation Rescue's really intense blockades back then. And, you know, I talk so much of the history that I excavated for this book, I didn't know. <laughs> I mean, I knew that there were blockades and I knew that clinics were bad, you know, dealing with really intense protests, but I didn't understand the level of intensity and ferocity that was coming from hundreds, sometimes thousands of people screaming. Mm -hmm. Now they don't need to do that as much. They still do, don't worry. But those people are in the government. They're on the Supreme Court. I mean, and so here's the thing. Years ago, and you probably remember this, um, I wrote about having a medically necessary abortion. And I, I, I got the attention of one of the people. I don't know if that name is in your book. I don't say it because I refuse to give her attention. But she so fringed the Operation Rescue at one point disavowed her because she testified oh. in front of Congress that they were throwing away babies in uh, hospital uh, laundry rooms, I think it was. And of course, that was easy to debunk. A nursing license to control all of those things, right? But one of the things that was sort of a surprise for me in that whole milieu is how focused she was on the idea and how she ginned up other people to be focused on the idea there was no way this could be healthcare, right? Yes. And at the same time she was saying this, um, there was a man who had written about his wife's 
very medically necessary. Mm -hmm. She had the same problems I did, a placental abruption in early in the second trimester, hemorrhaging, all of this. And one of the things, yeah. And one of the things that was so bizarre was to watch like the, the way that me talking about my experience meant I must be lying because I wouldn't give a bunch of strangers access to my medical records. Yes. But he was a hero for saving his wife. Right. And that's one of the things, because as far as I could tell, the fact that a lot of people seeking this form of healthcare are technically anti-abortion until they need one. Correct. Kind of then. <laughs> yeah, I've, I mean, I've personally walked in people to the clinic who have been affiliated with or even protested at the clinic. And you know what? Like, I'm going to walk you in just like anybody else because you have the same right to privacy, dignity, compassion that anyone else does. I would really prefer if you didn't come back next Saturday and scream at everyone. But um, it, you know what you're talking about here is the dehumanization and de and the stigmatization of something that's actually very common. And your situation is not quite as common, but no one ever knows. And no one has a right to know why someone needs to have an abortion. I don't need to know your history of like knee surgery or hip surgery. What are your cardiac issues, Mickey? Will you please share share your full rundown? Like this idea that our bodies don't belong to us um, is something that black and brown women in particular have always, always dealt with. Um, but the idea that abortion is public domain, that there can be the, the right to privacy, right? That was what Roe versus Wade is basically was built off of from Griswold v. Connecticut. It's not just about privacy and it's not just about um, your basic rights. It's about being a human being. And when you walk someone past men who are, and I say men because by and large, the loudest are men, um, screaming at them. I mean, the horrible things that would make your skin turn. Your job isn't, you can't solve that. Your job isn't to end that political fight in that moment. It's just to be with that person. And there is a kind of power in that small human dignity connection. Um, and that kind of power I actually think is very threatening to the other side, which is why they don't, they want to keep abortion as this public political war rather than what it is, which is a nuanced reality of humanity. And we all have to make decisions in our lives that maybe aren't ideal in the moment. You make the most of what you can. And if you might have an abortion and be like, yeah, I have to have an abortion. I'm going in guns blazing. And I've walked in some really amazing women who've done that but you might just be feeling ambivalent or uncomfortable. You know, it's health, it, no one wants to go to the doctor. I'm sorry if there are anyone out there who's a doctor, but like no one wants to go to the doctor, you know? Well, and this is one of the things that was sort of in, in my situation beyond it was maddening because, so I'm a disabled, I'm service connected disabled vet, right? Like this is not a secret, it says on an ID card. And at some <laughs> point in there, like people were like, well, if you have disabilities, you should have gotten pregnant. And I'm thinking, what does my leg have to do with my uterus? Like, right. But then I also think about this. So I have not done a lot of clinic escorting. I've mainly been the person who goes with friends who were going Which to, because I have recognized something very important while accompanying people. I do not have the personality to calmly walk in. I have the personality to crack somebody's jaw though. Like I really want to knock out some things. Yeah. Mickey, I can't really. So clinic escorting, if anyone out there isn't familiar and hasn't bought the book yet, please do. It would really make Mitch McConnell angry if you buy this book. But um, yeah. so <laughs> I can't really see Mickey. One of the things I admire and like about Mickey so much is that she just refuses to tolerate absurdity from people and, and and cruelty she won't tolerate it and that is really empowering and lovely a clinic escort's job is to somehow absorb all of that i mean the worst things you can imagine someone saying literally pretend it's not happening and focus on the patient and mickey <laughs> i think you would be an incredible advocate outside a clinic you would be an amazing counter protester if the clinic wants that 
Clinic Escort, maybe not so much in your wheelhouse. Oh. I don't even know if it's in my wheelhouse anymore. I look back and I wonder how I did it for so long because it's really taxing. And this is the thing. So I, I went with a stranger once. Um, I When I was leaving my ex-husband, there was someone at the domestic violence uh, center who needed to get an abortion. She didn't have anyone to go with her. I volunteered to go because I didn't have any judgy feelings about the entire thing. Now, without disclosing too much, I will say that she was in the center for very good reasons and that she needed to have this abortion so that she was no longer tied to the person who was right. the reason she was in the center. But it's a small town that I'm in at that point. And he finds out and he showed up outside the clinic. Um, and he cried and howled and whined and violated the restraining order and a bunch of other stuff. And while I sat in the room with her, while we were waiting for the actual procedure part to, to begin, um, we talked. And one of the things that has lived with me ever since is that she said, he only wants me to not do it so he can keep me. Ooh, but yes. I think, and then, and I said, well, that's a good reason not to, you know, I'm, I'm talking in the way that you talk when you're like, listen, I can go outside and take his head off, but like, I don't know what to say right now. Like, I don't. I can punch you him. could do a really good job of that, Mickey. Right? Like I was like, okay, we can I, we can jump him. We don't need. And to then play. she said, "But I think because he had harmed her in a way involving cigarettes, I think he would do that to the baby." Mm. And I thought, this is both a very loving choice you are making because I know, um, even as of right now, having an abusive partner is not a reason to curtail their access to any shared children. But can you imagine this is a situation where you've been forced into pregnancy um, and then you he wants to force you to keep this baby so he can use it to control and harm you and theoretically harm the child. And someone's going to say, well, you don't need an abortion. You need. And I'm like, well, a whole bunch of states, rapists have rights. Oh, yeah. They have rights. So and, that, and that mindset of that partner, I've actually seen partners i don't know if they're par current partners ex-partners show up at the clinic and try and wreak havoc you can tell there's mm -hmm. always something off but that kind of abusive mentality i actually think is the entire point of protesters in general which is i can't necessarily physically keep you from doing this so i'm going to make you feel as terrible about it as i can and that while maybe it isn't illegal, is morally repugnant to me. And it's, it, no matter why someone is having an abortion, that is an incredibly lovely, brave, wonderful reason to have an abortion. Another one is just like, you know what? I cannot have a baby. And most people who have abortions are already parents. So they really wanna be able to provide for the kids they have. Mm -hmm. um, abortion is not a selfish decision. It's actually, if we want to talk about individual responsibility, it can be a really responsible one, but I don't care why you choose it. And I never cared why any of the folks that I walked chose it as long as they were choosing it of their own free will, because it's really imperative to me that everyone gets to feel like at the very least I can control what happens here. Um, right. And that it doesn't just apply to abortion that applies to sexual assault, like this abusive mentality. They're all linked. Right. Um, and I, I'm not surprised that that happened. I'm so glad you were there with her because I'm unsure who knows what would have happened if you weren't. And that's kind of like you were a clinic escort without being a clinic escort in that moment. And this was the thing, because she had it done. We went back to the facility. He ends up getting detained because he's violating her training order. And it then meant that she could move, oh, yeah. right? She had nothing that could keep her in the state, no, nothing to tie her to him. She could leave. And the courts couldn't order her to come back. They couldn't order her to have contact. Whatever she was going to do after that, because it's, um, some shelters, and this was one, have a network to help people move. And mm. that was what she was going into. And she wanted nothing left behind. And I know that there are people who will say, well, that's a different situation. but I almost died. Somebody else can't afford to feed a child. Somebody else um, is with someone who they know will be a terrible parent. Someone like there's this laundry list of reasons. And I know you know this, but I feel like for the audience, we should kind of delve totally. into the fact 
that we don't have a crystal ball into anyone else's reasons for their choice, right? And we don't need to. Right. Why do you need to know that? I, I, I like. I I rarely, if ever, learned anything personal about anybody I walked into the clinic. It wasn't the point. It wasn't uh -huh. like, please tell me why you're here, madam. Like, all I wanted to do was make this person feel like they're a human being. And this idea of entitlement, that you're entitled to understand someone has to justify why they need to do this thing. I don't need to justify anything like that to anyone. Um, and, you know, what, what we're facing now in a possibly post row world is so much more of that requirement to justify, especially for marginalized women, like justify why. OK, so justify it. Why, well, why? I mean, and you might die. Well, that doesn't that actually doesn't matter anymore. Um, I just I, after I saw someone claim that ectopic pregnancies could be moved, I, I sort of mentally and emotionally tapped out of the idea that we need justification. Right. Because if you think that an ectopic pregnancy can be moved, I am no longer talking to a reasonable human being who has ever read, understood anything about reproductive health. Right. Before we get into repro rights, you don't even know where babies come from. One hundo. I can't I can't debate that with you. And I think that this is the other thing, the idea that being able to be pregnant somehow makes you less of an adult. Mm. But we don't have these conversations about vasectomies, going on, you know, Viagra or any of the other dozen yes. and one other things. I'm never going to have to justify why there's metal in my right ankle, right? These aren't, these are also medical procedures that affect the quality of your life, which functionally is what abortion is. Completely. I totally um, agree. And I think what's so, I hope we don't ever have to get to the point where you need to justify the metal in your leg. If we do, we've, we've really lost the buck, but, <laughs> but Mickey isn't going to tolerate that. Don't worry guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, abortion is really no different and mm -hmm. it's just treated and nor it, the, the treatment of it as different or other has been completely normalized. Well, and I was going to say, and the other thing is that I'm in a state, Illinois is a state that is pretty much setting up to be a sanctuary state. If, as we all expect, Roe goes away. Um, weirdly enough, I have a white billionaire governor and he doesn't suck. We're all so confused. Thanks, Pritzker. Right. Like, we're so confused, though. Like, he's For not now. awful. He's still got right. that. I know. I Well, we sent, like, seven other governors to jail. So I feel like this one has come in and looked around and gone. I used know, to live in I Illinois, so I can. Blagojevich was my governor when I lived there. So Okay. Yeah. So you understand. Your, your governor went to jail. Several of them. Sure did. Several of mine have. Um, and so, but this is the thing. He's put up these billboards at the borders of Missouri and other places, right? Um, inviting people into Illinois. And as a purely, I guess, selfish thing, I think a lot about what it will mean for the states that are currently pushing this, that are convinced people will stay. Many of them having economies that are, uh, definitely flagging mm -hmm. right who think that they're going to build their economy in this way but you know not with new people who want to be there but by forcing people to make new people right and i think a lot about how much of this has nothing to do even though the religious you know narratives have been applied and all of these other things have been applied they really have nothing to do with any particular moral stance mm -hmm. um that is better or worse Right. It's really about money. It's really about control and white supremacy and all of these things. And so for the clinic escorts, I, I think a lot about what it has taken to be calm during that, because again, just a baseball bat, just one <laughs> good swing. Um, but also about what it means to then have to watch these people who will threaten your life, bring their kid, bring their sister, bring themselves. Um, and then say, oh, wait, you mean that I have to like think about what this means after I leave? Like, how frustrating must that be for them right now and beyond? And then what happens if we do end up in this weird schism of 
safe harbor states, non-safe harbor states where it's illegal to leave this. They tried to make it illegal to leave the state to seek one. And I'm trying to figure out how you Missouri. regulate that doing. Missouri. Um, there's a reason we call it misery. This is a very inside baseball Illinois thing, but it's still why we call it's it. True, misery. I remember it. Yeah. And uh, we're going to end up, I guess, effectively with clinic escorts that really escort you over the border. Right. Such this a, is the yeah. history of abortion in America. Yes. And so many of the folks I spoke with for this book. So I spoke to people all over the country, past, present, um, and Many of them are doing this right now in Southern and Midwestern states, including Illinois, but Illinois is obviously a sanctuary. It passed the RH, uh, the Reproductive Health Act a few years ago. And um, not a single one of them, I was like, what are you gonna do if, you know, I also wrote this book like two years ago when I was like, I don't think Roe would actually be overturned. And then Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away. Um, But none of them, not one of them said, I'm just gonna pack it up call it a day. They're all going to find another way to help people. So now what this means is it's not just that Illinois will be a sanctuary state. It's that Illinois is going to be the only place for dozens of states that surround it where people can go to get an abortion unless they order medication abortion online and hopefully aren't subjected to criminalization, which for black and brown women is basically a non-starter. They've already been criminalized for that. So yeah, we're gonna have to physically move people and that means um, there are practical support organizations that have started doing this work, but it's gonna turn for into from clinic escorting into clinic shuttling out of state. Yeah. But there, there are a good number of clinics in Illinois. They are going to be inundated. Um, And there are only two clinics in Granite City, which is in the furthest, the most southern tip of the state, right across the river from Misery. They're already overwhelmed. And so that means the time you have to wait for an abortion grows, which means the cost of the procedure grows. And all of this is on purpose. (laughs) You know, I'm I'm thinking I'm I was I'm writing this piece for the cut about how we're going to solve this or, you know, the pa- practical support stuff and like the spirit of clinic escorts that are coming around and to try and figure out how to do this. And it kind of dawned on me, like every solution is going to be an imperfect solution because the oh. perfect solution is just for everybody to have fucking health care. <laughs> Can I cuss? Well, I just did. Um, <laughs> we, we're, we're going with it. We're going with it. The FCC um, isn't involved. We're fine. <laughs> it, that's the point, though, for everyone to have this And we don't have that. And that's, you know, clinic escorting is an imperfect solution to a problem that the federal government refused to do anything about, which was Mm -hmm. harassment at clinics. And it, it might sound really disheartening to say that, but on the other end for me, I actually find that that's the only place I can find hope in this moment, which is some of these people are gonna find a way to do something. It's not gonna be everything and it's not gonna solve all the problems, but we cannot, especially people of privilege right now, cannot give in to despair and just say, well, everything sucks, the end. Find a way to do something. And we can't just put that on the backs of the marginalized, um, which we've done for, I don't know, all of American history. So um, that's a, I'm asking a lot. I'm asking a lot, America. I mean, but I think that's, that's real, though, that America has to show up for this, right? Yes. That America has to think through what it's going to do. Because, like, I know for a lot of the Midwest, Illinois is the provider of a lot of things, right? When we legalized marijuana, all of a sudden, a big chunk of the Illinois budget comes from Indiana, a state that did not legalize, and we're right across the border. So I guess I'm going to Illinois. We go over there for fireworks. It's a trip. Uh, I remember that. I did go to yes. Gary, Indiana for fireworks once. Sorry, y'all. Why else would you go to Gary, Indiana? Why? Um, and listen, if somebody feels way about me talking about Indiana, I'm, Sorry, a born and raised, I'm a born and raised Illinois. Like, I was born in Chicago at Cook County Hospital. I don't know what to tell you. This oh. is in my DNA. I'm required required to see near Indiana at random intervals and misery, too. It's just I support it's that for you. Right. 
Um, but so one of the things about it, though, is exactly what you're saying. Like these clinics are going to be overwhelmed. And obviously, being a safe harbor state, other clinics can open, other people can come in. But then I can easily see people saying, well, a trip to Illinois means you can never return to whatever state, right? Like that becomes sort of the cachet. Oh, you went to Chicago, you were really getting an abortion, weren't you? Right. And I think that that is one of those things where we are not really talking about what it will mean in terms of that population decline. Because if you don't have to go back, um, for a lot of people, they are already making decisions to leave, whether it's Florida or Texas, or right? Uh, we're going to see that sort of weird reverse of, of the migration south that was happening is my suspicion, right? The Great Migration pushed a bunch of people from oppression north. I have not thought about this, Mickey. This is, this, is this your next book? <laughs> this is really- I'm going to talk a little bit about this in, <laughs> in, in, in the way that like the rhythm of bigotry changes how America functions, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the, the concept of the sundown state a la Oregon meant that Oregon never developed the population you would expect um, because you couldn't have Black people. And a lot of cultural and social underpinnings, not that there's none there now, but a lot of the cultural and social underpinnings that you get in a New York or a Chicago or any of the major cities doesn't really happen in places that just were able to keep out right. a large Black and brown population. So if you are now a sundown state, sundown area, and you have now pushed out women, their families, other people who can get pregnant, right? Yeah. What does your population look like? Yeah. What does your job market look like? Because people who don't want to buy into this weird quasi, you know, Republic of Gilead concept that's going on here. Um, there are also people who do things like work in schools, work in hospitals. Yeah. Uh, provide all of this other stuff, right? So where's the end goal, do you think? Right, like we're gonna end abortion, okay, but then like, what's the end goal? Because we've already established that the end of row isn't the end of abortion, so. What you're highlighting is such a good point, which is I don't think they know. I really don't. I think the goal from the day that Roe versus Wade was decided, the goal has been to overturn it. But they're it's they're not thinking beyond that. <laughs> they're not thinking, well, how do we support a whole new generation of children who wouldn't be born otherwise? No, they don't care. Um, it's not like they they oppose abortion and want like free health care for everyone. But I think what's really interesting is when you don't see people who have abortions as human, when you don't think about the humanity behind people who make choices that maybe you don't understand or agree with, it's really easy to just say, ban it and who cares? You know, like, I think, I think about, I think about the women who came before us, before Roe versus Wade. I was born in 1985. I'm pretty sure you were born after Roe v. Wade. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, like I've, we've never known, we've never lived in a world, in a, in a country where abortion has been illegal. And we're going to find out what that really does, where half of the country exists in an entirely different way than the other half. I also think people need to understand they aren't planning to just stop at that. It's not like they're like, yay, we overturned Roe, we did it. <laughs> Like, oh, they've, they've already started to try one, to clear right? birth control, right? Like birth control is now. An exactly. They want to overturn the entire right to privacy on which all of this was predicated. But they want to ban abortion nationally. I'm not saying they will be able to. But what we all have to ask ourselves is, first of all, we cannot possibly be telling people who live in states where it's criminalized, like, just move. Like, <laughs> You know, like, mm, yes, I'm sure that woman in the Mississippi Delta would love to just move with her, like, when she doesn't have a car. And, like, you know, we have to understand the realities of people's lives. But we also have to understand that especially marginalized people in this country have always found a way to do what they need to do for themselves and their families. And they're going to do it now. So I am not interested. I'm horrified. But I am curious to see how this is going to play out in the next few years because I don't really think they ever thought 
I don't think the four moderate Republicans who still exist <laughs> ever really thought this would happen. Um, and for everyone else, I don't think they thought beyond it. And people, you know, what this writing this book has taught me is that people find a way to to help and people find a way to pursue liberation, even if it's a tiny minuscule, you know, assertion of liberation in a moment, like people are going to find a way to do that because people are people. Well, and I was going to say, one of the things that I think is sort of lost here is that even when abortion was illegal, abortion still happened. Yes. Right. Um, I was born post Roe, but my grandmother was full of stories. My aunts are full of stories about what it took to get it handled. And, you know, it's a very casual sort of, sometimes you had to go to a woman, you know, somebody knew, right? Uh, or you went to a back alley, a doctor, blah, blah, blah. Like, and it's In like Chicago, a you called Jane. Right. right. Like, and it was, and that's the thing. They had like a list of the reasons and ways that you would handle it, right? And we have old songs about parsley and rue and comfrey, yep. and, right? And those are abortive fashions as well, right? And you can't regulate that out. I know there are people who will think you can regulate that out, but we have, my undergrad is in history. We know what happened when abortion was illegal. People died. Yes. That's, that's the thing. People died from illegal abortions. People died from infections. Um, sometimes people uh, fresh out of options took themselves out as well as that's into true. their pregnancy. This is not going to be the population boom that I think in some bizarre way, based off some of the things they've said, I think they think it's happening. I think that the people who can move will move because that's what happened before. Yeah. The people who cannot move will be contacting people they know who did move yeah. or mail order escorting all of these things. Does that mean that everyone will get what they need? No, but that means that a new fight opens up, right? Because if you go after birth control or uh, condoms or whatever the plan here is. And I'm a Same little- Same-sex marriage, all of it. Right. Um, hormone replacement therapies for, mm -hmm. um, you know, menopausal people could be on the table here. You could have, obviously, trans health care is on the table for them. They were Even IVF. To, right. Even IVF, right. And when you start to get into that, sort of range of things, right? Then you have to start asking yourself, well, the people pushing this the hardest don't want to have to face any of the consequences. Because on the other side of this, what they're not pushing for, they didn't want the child tax credit to be expanded. They didn't want the monthly payments during COVID or increased child care subsidies yep. or any of the other things, right? They want to prevent people from making choices of return this right to privacy. And then that's it, right? We still don't have a plan to feed any of the children they think will pass. We don't need that. We don't have a plan for the kids already in foster care. Never mind. No, right? and I, I, I think there was never the plan was never the point, right? Like the, it's just to make people suffer. As Adam Serwer wrote, the cruelty is the point. Like they want to make you suffer, and that's why. I think on the other side of things, there are a lot of people who in this moment want to help, but they don't know how. And so they're like, I'll start an anti-network on Facebook. Like, I'll start an underground railroad group on, you know, Reddit. And it's like, your willingness to help is beautiful. There are people who are doing this stuff already. And you can, you know, like, you can you can plug into them. But I, I think back to your point, there is no real concern for a child or life because if you cared about life, you would feel the life in front of you in that moment. Like as a clinic escort, all, I cannot help but respond as a human to a human. And when you dehumanize people to that level, when you literally think that JFK Jr. is going to come back, I, I still, I, I don't understand that one QAnon, I'm sorry. Um, but like when you're, when you're completely divorced from 
reality and in abortion particularly it's easy to become divorced from the reality of abortion because we don't talk about it so then it becomes well sluts have abortions you know well i don't know anyone who had an abortion when you absolutely do <laughs> um it's it's so easy to dehumanize and eradicate someone's sense of humanity and dignity and then who cares what happens to them i don't care you know like for a hundred years in this country well well before it was founded but for the first hundred years of this country people literally owned people <laughs> like they owned people there was no plan for like how do we take care of these no like they owned people and they wanted to own people forever and i mean my god like the cruelty is the entire point and i that is why i think there is power in being I don't want to say like kindness is everything. I don't believe that. I believe sometimes like you need to meet fire with fire, which is mm -hmm. why I like you, Mickey. Um, but there are times when it's just like a softening towards someone can feel like an opening up of something entirely new. And, you know, some of my most fun, I wasn't really supposed to do this at the clinic, but like sometimes I would try to talk to them, to the antis, and they really did not like that. They were very uncomfortable with me. They like, they they don't want to think of you as a person because they're a person and what they're doing is horrible. Well, and I think that that point about dehumanization is sort of how we, like this, there's this amorphous tone that comes up in this, right? When you are interacting with people. Ooh, Lauren's video just went away. No. Is Lauren's voice still there? Okay, Lauren's voice is still there. We're gonna we're gonna cross our fingers. And I can still see you. This. Okay, good. Okay, good. Did you turn off your camera by accident? Sure didn't. Okay. <laughs> this is, this is. Anyway, just keep talking. They don't need to okay. see your face. Okay, we're gonna make we're gonna make this work. We're gonna make this work. There we are. Um hopefully your camera comes back. Um oh well, I'm no. trying something. I'm trying something. Okay. okay. Did that do anything? No. Well. No. No. We're podcasting. Oh, someone can see me. Okay. Okay. You now can't see, can me, see but me. I don't know. Hi, friends. All right. Let me refresh my. Uh, <laughs> have you, I I will try. Nikki and I have not had a drink, but we definitely could use one. Um, it says it's waiting for Mickey to reconnect, so I'm not sure if this is a Wi-Fi issue on her end, but. I do want to talk a little bit more about what Mickey was already. Yes. Alluding. Oh, you're back. God bless. Yes. I don't have to vamp. Thank you. No. I was about to do that. We can vamp. Uh <laughs> no, we can't. But I enjoy vamping. So it's so fun. Really. That's I what I like. I, I literally was like, look at the internet. I need that cup. I need that cup for real. We're gonna send it to you as a as, I'm gonna send you one as a congratulations for your book thing. I'm gonna say I'm gonna hit her up. Mickey. You're gonna make you a cup. Um, um I I wanna I really wanna talk really quickly with you especially about mm -hmm. um i i allude to this in the book but i didn't talk about it in depth about like the law enforcement issue um because like um i don't know if any of you have heard but police aren't great <laughs> um you know so they're like when I, i'm talking about multiple multiple facets but in, in dealing with in particular like abortion clinics, I have a whole chapter on like how cops generally suck at enforcing laws mm -hmm. and protecting patients. But then the other thing that like occurred to me when I was actually writing the epilogue to this book in the fall of 2020 was like, and I think actually a clinic escort mentioned this to me, they don't like to call the cops because the black and brown patients feel extremely uncomfortable rolling up to the clinic and seeing a cop car. And I was like, damn, like the like, I just, that had not occurred to me um, in my, like, white lady shit. Like, I'd never thought of that before. And I, I don't know, I, I don't know what, I really want you to find the solution to this. People keep asking me for solutions. I'm like, I don't know. What do you think? I mean, like, I, I, I honestly a black think, woman, yeah. Right. I was to say, as a black woman who's been to the clinic, I honestly think the solution really is whether it is a one mile rule, which would be my preference, your protest has to be a mile away from the clinic um, or, or, or what? Because in my experience, A, the cops don't necessarily help 
nope. anybody. Because I'm not going to say that the cops are particularly helpful to the protesters either. From no, what but I've they seen. don't. They don't defuse the situation. They, right. They do basic. So listen, the thing with Chicago police is they solve less than uh, 30% of, of murders. Our overall solve rate is really low, right? And a lot of what they do, I don't know if you all have seen those those videos from New York on the trains and stuff where they're just standing there on their phones. I feel like that is like the archetype of policing in a lot of major cities where these clinics will be located. They're not doing anything for anybody, right? They haven't picked a side. There's no stop. They're just standing there. Um, and when they are doing something, it's wrong. Like, Right. But I feel like one of the things really is at a state or federal level, and I would argue federal level, we wouldn't let this happen at any other health clinic, right? Correct. If you showed up to protest at a pediatrician's clinic, everybody's getting some handcuffs. Yes. And I don't understand this bizarre sort of fake political loophole, right? Because the other thing is that historically, abortion just wasn't as much of a political hot potato until like, it got convenient to be a political hot yes. potato. For a very long time, it was it was a private medical choice um, that wasn't discussed in polite society, but also wasn't completely hidden. And it because, wasn't banned. Right. Like, like, it was legal. No one cared. cared. Right. And so I think that that's kind of where we should have been heading during this. And we have socially, in some cases, managed it. I have a relatively good feeling about sort of millennials gen younger gen x on down but we're also in this weird place not to say that all of them because yes i know i know um but we're also in this weird place where a lot of the people who have the strongest feelings about abortion are at no risk of having one not just because of gender so but because they're, they're the reproductive window has hit its sunset right you're not gonna get pregnant uh and so you have to step back and kind of look at it and be like, okay, so the cops aren't helping. But what are the politicians whose job it is to actually protect people's rights doing? And I don't just mean Republicans. I'm Now I'm going to turn and look at Democrats. Totally. And and I'm going to look at progressives and leftists as well. Because do. Uh, I got to say this, and I'm going to make a bunch of people unhappy here. One of the reasons this has been able to be such a political hot potato for as long as it has been is that everybody else wants to pretend that this is a problem for someone that is marginalized based on gender and reproductive status totally. uh, to solve solo, right? Um, if at any point a major uh, church, and I'm going to now look at the Church of Latter-day Saints and uh, the Catholic Church in particular, what up, had said, you know what? We are tapping out of this. Their leadership had said this is none of our business. Um, we would immediately see a whole bunch of people at those clinics wander on back home because there's no one pushing them, right? We don't kind of don't talk about this, but a lot of this has been about people misunderstanding the concept of church and state. Yes. Right? They think that the state should be able to uh, fight them, basically, uh, but only when they want the state to fight them or fight for them. And otherwise, you should do what they want. This is not a theocracy is really what it kind of boils down and to. And don't tell them to wear a mask because that's a violation of their freedom. <sighs> they really love the word freedom. They love they love the concept of freedom of speech and, and their personal freedom not to wear a mask and infect a million people. They don't love hearing that other people are adult humans who exist. Were we supposed to ask people questions? Let people ask you questions? Oh, I don't know. Things. Folks, if you have questions, there's a thing that says ask a question. <laughs> Right. We started talking to each other in the shenanigans and we've not been paying attention. This is to what Mickey and I have done since like as long as I've known her. Whenever we're on a panel together, look out everybody else. You're in real trouble. But that's part of I just remember that the, the you one know what I'm did. talking about. Yes. 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 Ooh. Um, Had but, it coming. <laughs> this is part of what I like Mickey, you've written and spoken publicly about your abortion, but like abortion isn't your beat. Um, your beat is being a badass, you know, like, you, like race, gender, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what I love about your perspective is that abortion is just like a duh. <laughs> like it's just like because you understand that like abortion is a facet of people's lives. Um, and it was a facet of your life, not one you ever expected, but it was. And like, 
this idea like I'd never have an abortion. I would never have an abortion. Do you know? <laughs> Do you I, know what I you will, would? I will say this as somebody who was relatively certain I would have one and if I needed one and then ended up, I thought, not needing one. And then I did need one. A lot of people think that pregnancy is like this warm, wonderful, glowy event. And I got to tell you, um, actually, pregnancy kind of sucks. Um, yeah. For some like rare lucky few, it doesn't. Uh, I was not one of those people, right? So even my, I have been pregnant. This is a full disclosure moment. I have been pregnant five times in my life. I've had two successful pregnancies. I only had one abortion, right? Because statistically, 50% of pregnancies end in a miscarriage. I am a statistic, right? And the miscarriages, two miscarriages I had were relatively early. And then I had to have this, which was happening because I was also having, for the record, a, mis a miscarriage. It was just a second trimester miscarriage, right? right? And miscarriage doesn't necessarily mean everything passes on out and you're fine. Correct. That's another place where you could die. Like pregnancy is this pitfall in many ways where even if you want children, even if you have planned and chosen and all of those things, it can go wrong because if you look at the math of how pregnancy occurs, it's amazing we managed to put the sperm and the egg together in the first place, right? Like there's like a whole game of catch that has to happen in there and right temperatures and all of this other stuff. Like the science is wild, right? I can't wait to read your book about that. Keep going. Like when I first found out that like things have to kind of float on by and be caught and then attach. And then I was like, this is like badminton. Like, I feel like this is playing lacrosse with, with DNA. I've never been pregnant. So I have not played lacrosse in that way, but I take your word for it. So then you, but let's say you do, you get pregnant successfully. One of the things about this whole anti-abortion thing that is so weird to me is that statistically without anyone doing anything, half of these pregnancies will not complete. Yes. Another significant chunk, right? Once we get through, like, and that, that, that number is like really early. Then we get to genetic problems, other health issues, car accidents, illnesses. Ectopic oh, pregnancy. Right. Ectopic pregnancies were. Which are not viable, folks. <laughs> they're not, not viable at all. And like when you start to get into that breakdown, then it's like, well, uh, folks, we're just going to be surprised if something human and alive comes out, right? Like the math is, is not on our side. As a species, we're a meat suit with delusions of grandeur. Uh, we have questions. Um, I love that. Okay. Also, so, just FYI, y'all, abortion is 14 times safer than childbirth. So, Well, and we didn't have a chance to get into this, but I want to point out that uh, the U.S. has one of the highest maternal mortality rates of uh, everyone. Uh, it has no, the highest um, of the developed world. Yes, yes. And our Black maternal mortality rate is atrocious. <laughs> it's beyond shocker right? and so i don't know why i'm laughing it's not that. funny it's actually really horrible. it's not funny but it, it in a weird way it is funny because there's all of this energy to prevent abortion and nothing to save the people who would like to have babies yes right there's there's not there's nothing for them we don't want to keep you alive if you have chosen to have a child we don't want to make it possible for you make it easy for you to raise and yep. feed that child or, and provide that child with education or no, medical care suffer. or any of the things we don't even want you to have clean water for that child. Nope. So like. Need, nor do we want you to even have like a clean septic tank if you live in some parts of Alabama. We have questions. Yes. Yes. Okay. So what do you envision for abortion meds by mail in the future? Mm. How can we best support access to this nationally and keep it from being criminalized in the same way that killing procedures have been? Have become? Great question. Um, so medication abortion, which is commonly called the abortion pill. This is not plan B. Plan B is emergency contraception that prevents pregnancy from happening. Happening. Pl uh, plan C, as it's sometimes referred to, emergency contraception terminates a pregnancy. It's very safe and it's possible to self-manage an abortion through medication abortion safely. You can purchase pills online please don't purchase pills and then post all over the internet about how you're going to give them away because that's illegal and you will get in trouble. Instead, like everyone should know if you're in the U.S., aid access, you can go on to aid access and purchase, and purchase medication, medication abortion. abortion. And, and it, it, oh, oh, we're, we're echoing, echoing again. again. 
aren't we? No, no we're, we're not. not. Yes, yes, we are. We are. Anyway, anyway, you can we're almost done. Yeah. But, but just, just keep, keep in mind, mind we, can't we can't stop, stop criminalization. criminalization. Black and brown women are going to be criminalized. They already have been for pregnancy outcomes, including miscarriage, like Mickey talked about. And what we can do, I think, for, particularly for white women, is continue to purchase abortion pills for yourself. Buy pills for yourself and ask your local prosecutors, where do you stand on this? If, a particular, particularly if you're in a hostile state, make sure that they understand that you as a taxpayer do not support them criminalizing someone for pregnancy outcomes. I think medication abortion is an amazing option. It's not for all abortions um, and it's not going to solve all the problems, but it will help folks. Aid access is the place to go. That's my answer. I stopped echoing. All right. And then one other question. What does your dear SCOTUS poster say? Oh, uh, it says dear SCOTUS abortion access now. So <laughs> this is actually a poster that I got at, um, oh, back in March of 2016 when I was protesting. I was at like a rally at the Supreme Court for the oral arguments for that abortion rights case back then that we all thought was going to be the big one and it was <laughs> only the first of many but um yeah I framed it and it's it's there and I funnily enough I don't believe SCOTUS is going to deliver us and you know I don't think the Supreme Court's going to save us I don't think they're going to save abortion I don't think they're going to save voting rights they have no desire to do that we're going to have to do it for ourselves and that was my dog. Did anybody hear that? Oh, my puppy. Yes. Um, but this is, we're going to have to do it for ourselves. And we can. And I hope that, if nothing else, this book can give you a little bit of feeling of hope and that you're not powerless. And thank you again to Mickey <clears throat> three years ago for telling me to get off my butt and finish the book proposal. <laughs> Listen, this is the most timely book. The most timely book. Thank you. Right? Because unfortunately, uh, I suspect in a few weeks, we will hear that it has been overturned. Um, and I'm gonna say something that I think people should really consider, which is to make it cost in your state if you are yes. in one of these states. Not just in a get out and vote way, but in a, hey, you know what? We can protest outside this governor's house. We can write our senators, we can not vote in anybody that would be on board with this, and we could go out and help register people to vote. Yep. Um, because I think, unfortunately, when this push comes to shove, this is going to end up in one of those congressional interactions where who your state rep is will matter. Completely. Who your governor is is going to who matter. Who your state legislators are, you need to know. Right, and you've got to show up for all of those boring meetings that you can. Um, now, I am a big fan of Illinois' approach to bad leadership, which is handcuffs. We need to give more of them to mayors, but we like giving them to governors, and we're working on giving them to more mayors. We sure do. And I think you should give them to as many people as you need to. Kentucky, Tennessee, I'm looking at some of your state reps. Listen, handcuffs. <laughs> handcuffs. They're the and perfect. Give them medication abortion. Just kidding. Don't do that. That's illegal. <laughs> If you can't, if you can't do that, you can give them handcuffs. And in fact, it might not be the worst thing to like have protests where you mail them handcuffs. I, that I endorse. I endorse that. Right. But I think like, I know we're wrapping, but I just want to say like, that is the right point, which is we're not in the minority people. The majority of Americans actually support this right. They support abortion and having it be safe and legal. So we don't need to apologize for that or act defensive. Act like you know that you're in the majority on this because you are. And we're, you know, we're just going to have to find a way. Like three years ago, I had to get off my butt and finish that proposal. Now, America, we're going to have to get off our butt and find a way to make this happen. And I'm just so to grateful to you, Mickey, for standing up for this right all the time and for all of your work and for talking to me for like the coolest hour I've had in a hot second. Y'all, I'm I'm wearing sweatpants and I'm chilling with Mickey Kendall. So 
you're gonna have way more cool out. We're gonna do this again. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. Been a good it's been great. Um, and I also, I just want to thank you for writing this book, for being an escort. Abortion literally saved my life. I will always defend people's right to seek it. Um, and for saying what we really needed to hear, which is that this is a right that we will have to fight for and we will have to defend and we will have to push to enhance it because now, listen, the solution here isn't to have it rest on a single case. It's to make it so that it is in the law of the land in the constitution they love so much. That's what amendments are for. Yes, that's it. I can't top that. Buy the book. It's not better than that. But buy the book. <laughs> buy the book. Buy, you, buy, buy two, three copies, give it away to friends. Also, a great protest might be to mail copies of it to your politicians. Send it to Ted Cruz. <laughs> Tell them that they're teaching this in your local schools and see what he oh. says. I'm, I wouldn't be a poster. Mm. Okay, I know Mickey's we'll, thinking we'll about it now. <laughs> thank you all I might so do much. that. I might, I, might, I might do that. Thank um, you all. Thank you all so much. Thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.